Inflation is rising, recession is looming, and all those millions of people who cut the cord to do most of their TV viewing on streaming are feeling the squeeze from their subscription video on demand services. No surprise, viewers really like free things in tight economic times. I'm Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, and this is Talking TV, the podcast that brings you smart conversations about the business of broadcasting. Today, that conversation is with Marco Di Giacomo, CMO of Amagi. Marco and Amagi are preaching the gospel of fast channels, free ad-supported television for these challenging times. He believes that broadcasters need to be there and that the big streamers need to and will start licensing their content more widely there. Coming up, conversation about why he believes the future is fast. Talking TV is brought to you by Futuri, whose post for TV podcasting system is specifically designed for the needs of TV broadcasters. Post for TV makes going from newscast to podcast an effortless transition. It enables broadcasters to create, publish, analyze, and monetize both broadcast on demand and original podcast series from the same platform. Post for TV is a powerful system for capturing podcast opportunities in a turnkey fashion. It ingests and automatically edits newscast audio for optimum fidelity and publishes blocks or full newscasts to on-demand audio platforms. You can learn more about Post for TV at futurimedia.com slash post for TV. Welcome, Marco, to Talking TV. Thank you for having me, Michael. Thanks for being here. Now, Marco, I've got to put a big note right at the top of our conversation that Amagi is a company that helps organizations to launch fast channels on a software as a service basis. So you've got some skin in the game and you're hardly coming at this from a disinterested position. But that said, you are absolutely adamant that fast channels are going to be a key part of the media ecosystem and that broadcasters need to be launching them. Why? Well, listen, Michael, when I talk with people about my decision to join Amagi and about what's happening in this market, the way I tell them the story is relatively simple. From an industry point of view, what we're seeing is that the $60 billion or so that today are in on the air television are going to get digital for the simple reason that the connected TVs are becoming the vast majority of the displays that you have out there. In the US at this point, we're past the 80% mark. In Europe, we're fast approaching it. And when you look at the the capabilities that the digital transmission enable, they drive an increase of almost 3x in your CPM. So for broadcasters, it's a no-brainer to move to digital. And as they move to digital, a big chunk of the content that they have is content that they will want to retain as free content because what that's the way that users are used to effectively consuming without having to pay for it. So it's a win for them in terms of being able to get more money for the same content that they have. It's a win for consumers because they get to use the advanced capabilities of these new displays that they bought. And yes, it opens the opportunity for Amagi to make a few dollars, as you can imagine, enabling all of this. It also creates down the line more opportunities that we can talk about. So what kinds of fast channels do you see broadcasters most profitably launching? Well, the data that we have seen uh, suggests that mostly sports and news uh, are the ones that attracted public attention. But in general, we've seen uh, everything that uh, spans uh, all the way through older TV shows uh, or uh, if you want uh, Uh, more specialized TV shows to crime and drama. Again, in general, what we're seeing as the uh, genres that go for fast, the same genres that are most popular on broadcasting television, and that is typically news uh, and sports. Mm -hmm. Which is a lot of what they are. Those who are launching are typically launching their news, particularly. Um, What are the targeting advantages to fast? Yeah, so, I mean, listen, it's, uh, to use a, an old uh, expression, it's in the land of the blind, the one-eyed are king, meaning 
the argument that there is is always the argument of how targeted can you be on a television compared to on the screen of a cell phone because when you look at a cell phone that is as i as identifiable and as personal an experience as you can get uh, i know i used to work at verizon because i know who you've been you know that it's you you know where you are you know uh, a lot of long tail history of where you've been before, what you've done before, et cetera, et cetera, which creates all of the type of privacy issues that we're seeing. When you're talking about the connected television, what I know is it's in a certain household by IP address. And so the person watching it is typically a member of the family. I know from multiple research that in 80% of the cases, uh, it's more than one person. In about 60% or so, it's two typically, but that's driven mostly by the demographic of households. Um, the thing that it creates uh, that over the air doesn't have uh, is it creates the ability for me to know which household is, household is watching. And that from an advertisement point of view is again a one-eyed one view compared to the blind view of the A. I'm broadcasting over the air and anybody and anybody could be watching this thing. Again, Nielsen does a fantastic job at measuring this after the fact, but compared to the ability that G digital has of effectively tracking in real time, where is it that something is being watched uh, and adjusting therefore the type of advertisement so that what I am watching and getting as an advertisement is different from what you are watching and getting as an advertisement, Michael, is a massive capability and it's what drives this significant jump in CPM. I have to say, Marco, that's the first time, and I can't remember how long that I've heard Nielsen and Fantastic Job said in the same sentence. So that's remarkable right there. It's a challenge of the job that they have to do if you think about it, because effectively they're trying to establish a feedback loop where one is not built in. The advantage of digital is that it's naturally a feedback loop and it has that uh, built in. So one needs to acknowledge the fact that if you have built a steam engine, you've done a fantastic job. Doesn't mean that it's better than a combustion engine, but it's a move forward compared to horses and carts. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's put that qualifier on it. You see fast at an inflection point. Why? Well, mostly because my background is in artificial intelligence. I've worked on it both as an engineer and data science uh, at the beginning of my career, and most recently at Verizon, rolling out a personalization platform that won a bunch of awards. And if you think about what's happening with AI, FAST is going to be the primary beneficiary of what is happening in the next three to five years. What I mean by that is this, which is the moment you have something on FAST, the first thing that you benefit from is the fact that the experience on a digital television is going to change from one in which you have a finite number of channels that people have to navigate with a remote, the famous 99 or 999 channels that has to scroll through, to an experience of browsing that can be done effectively through AI. I can ask my Google or uh, Alexa or Siri to inform my television that I want to watch a channel or a show that has this actor, that has this gender, that was shot in this date, that has this title. And the limitation that I have is not the fact that I personally have to scroll through all of those. AI can do that for me. That technology exists today, and it's a technology that is being adopted by a lot of manufacturers or will be adopted for sure in the next few years. The second thing that you'll see is the fact that if you think about the capabilities of AI, what AI has already conquered is text. You type on any word processor these days, and there's always something in the back end trying to correct your spelling and suggest you what the next word should be. That's AI being able to absorb what you're writing and provide valuable suggestions based on that. The same capabilities exist already on audio. You can talk to your Alexa device, to your Siri, to your Google Home and or Google Assistant, because AI is already able in real time to consume audio, just like it's already able in real time to consume text. What is still struggling, and it's a purely computational issue, so it's the type of thing that anybody who's been in tech for a while knows that more slow will take care of in the next two to five years, is video, in particular real-time video. I can today have a movie 
watched and or tagged by AI and decide based on the content of the movie, what is the optimal place for me to put a piece of advertisement? I cannot do it on a live show. I cannot do it on news. I cannot do it on sports because by the time AI has been able to absorb the fact that a goal was just scored, that a home run was just hit, that uh, uh, breaking news came up, it's too late for me to insert the ad. All of this needs to happen in milliseconds. And those capabilities are going to be there, which are going to effectively change the experience, both for advertisers and for content providers, because I will be able to go to advertisers and say, would you like to advertise your product when the team that is supported by this household, which I typically would know because it's the type of uh, games that they're watching. They're always watching the Yankees games, as an example. They're probably a Yankees supporters. Would you like to watch to serve your advertisement right after the team that they're supporting scores something? So when the mood, if you want, is a bullion, or vice versa, would you like to show something when the mood is in the opposite direction? Maybe one of your competitors' advertisers, advertisements, as an example. And so the concept is that this challenge that advertisers always have, which is how do I make my advertisement more personalized, more contextual? So far, it's only operated on the creepy side, for lack of a better term, which is making it contextual and personal to Michael or to Marco as they're watching something, which is what is driving this backlash around privacy. But we haven't consumed the contextual dynamic of what is happening on the screen. We haven't made the advertisement relevant to what I am watching and the emotions that what I am watching is driving. And what we know in this business is the fact that what video is amazing at is driving emotions. And emotions are what buys, what drives buying behaviors from consumers. I, so again, you know, the- mm -hmm. Margo, I need to inject a little skepticism though into that because that seems like an awfully nuanced and sophisticated uh, improvement over the fact that right now on any given um, AVOD service that I might watch, I'm seeing the same insurance ad in every single pod, the same two, three ads. And that's across almost every service that I've consumed from an AVOD uh, point of view. So yeah, and you're absolutely right, Michael, in the fact that what I am describing, which is AI dominate, or AI taking over video is something that is starting to happen. Fake videos are the most exalted, if you want, experience but it takes so long that it's not yet mainstream. I can have within two weeks uh, out of five hours of video from you, a video where I have you say and do whatever I want, but may not be do, but certainly say whatever I want. It takes me two weeks to get that, and it takes me hours of the video. So you see how the barrier today is still a barrier that makes it not economically convenient for me to do something like this, even on movies. The thing is, in technology, what we know is that the cost of the processing power that my PC had 10 years ago, which was equivalent to the cost of a car, is what I get today when I buy a cell phone. Right. And that's, that's yeah. the beauty of tech. Well, then let's let's circle back on this point in a couple of years and see where we are then, perhaps. Absolutely. Let me ask you, lastly, do you see the major streaming platforms loosening up their exclusivity and licensing their content more widely to fast channels? And if so, why would they do that? So I think in general for two reasons. So the short answer is yes, we're already seeing some of it. And the reason to be transparent with you is economical. The two things that you're seeing, and you're seeing it with Netflix as an example, is one, that typically the large platforms make less, in the long term, you typically make less than 40% on your own and operated, for lack of a better term, of the value of the content that you're creating. And this is simply because no matter how successful you are, the reach of the, plat the other platforms is always going to be larger than yours. And therefore, what happens is that you have value in licensing your content to other platforms. The second reason is that it is the norm of this industry, if you think about it, that we always start with the most premium experience. It used to be movie theaters for movies. Then we window this thing down. 
And what digital is creating with, again, the vast capabilities that we're discussing in terms of ability to effectively have an infinite number of channels and or options is that it's giving you the opportunity for a very marginal cost to add the visibility to your content. It's a little bit like what Amazon did with uh, the Kindle where if you wanted to publish a book before the Kindle existed, you know, unless you had at least 5,000 people willing to buy it, you'd be operating at a loss because the cost of printing the book would essentially require you that type of volume to be able to be an attractive publisher. But with the Kindle, you can be an attractive publisher to Amazon if you have 50 friends and family members that are willing to buy it because the marginal cost is that much lower. Mm -hmm. So what's happening here is, to a certain extent, the same thing, which is because the, the long tail cost of, well, if I have this channel, I have to give something else up. Therefore, there is a marginal cost for me to adding it uh, is dropping because of this the increased discoverability. You're going to see more and more that why wouldn't I do it? It's money on the table that has no marginal cost for me. Mm -hmm. Well, Marco, things are moving fast. Oh, I can't stop the punning for sure. So um, let's continue to watch this space and see how your predictions turn out. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Appreciate you being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Thanks to all of you for watching and listening. You can find the vast back catalog of Talking TV episodes at tvnewscheck.com and on our YouTube channel. See you next time. A new episode of Talking TV is available most Fridays on tvnewscheck.com. You can also listen and subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Spotify.